Hello and welcome back to GoldStockTrades.com. Today we have back here with us Mark Selby. Mark is CEO of Royal Nickel. Royal Nickel can be traded as RNX on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Thanks, Mark, for being back here with us today. Thanks, Jeb. Mark, the nickel story is, uh, and the nickel price has been rising so far in 2014. It's made a move from low, lower $6 area to close to $8. Talk to us about what's going on uh, with nickel outperforming so many of the other um, base and precious metals. Yeah, no, I mean, definitely nickel is the standout metal so far this year, um, as you said, outpacing all the rest of the metals. And and fundamentally, you know, what's driving it is is more and more people in the market recognizing the impact of uh, the Indonesian ban, which is going to take out 25% of world supply. Um, th that's causing uh, restocking to start happening through both the nickel and stainless steel chain. Uh, stainless steel is a end destination for 70% of nickel. So consumers in those spaces are starting to stock up, which is starting to create demand right through the chain. Um, and the interesting thing with the nickel price is that even though it's moved up pretty aggressively, anytime there's any sort of a pullback, um, it, it gets met by um, some additional consumer buying and, and generally bounces back pretty quickly. So we're very happy with the way uh, the nickel price has performed uh, to date. Um, if you look at a couple of the other underlying drivers, you know, the, the, the this or or ban or export ban from Indonesia um, has led the Chinese to try and find supply elsewhere. And Philippines is one of the only places where we think they'll only be able to replace 10 or 20 percent of what Indonesia is shipping. We've seen ore prices. So in the fourth quarter of last year, the Chinese were able to buy ore for about $25 a ton. Um, as of last week, that ore price for the same grade material is now up over $85 a ton. Uh, that alone is almost a $3 an increase um, in the cost of production for those producers in China. So, so far, the, the, the increase in the LME price has just basically mirrored the, the move up in the cost curve because of the uh, increase in price in uh, input material. So, uh, again, it's, it's a you know, bullish stage for you know, where we think nickel prices are going to go back up to 2006 7 levels of 15 to $20 a pound by this time next year. Mark, one of the interesting slides, one of your presentations is uh, a, a chart of the ch of the metals and China's self sufficiency. Uh, it's it nickels on they only fifteen percent. Uh, China is self uh, sufficient on compared to so many other other metals. So they're going to have to look abroad. So where where are they looking abroad uh, for these metals for for nickel? For nickel, yeah. So. You know, that's one of the key things, again, with this 25% of supply coming out of the market, if they could replace it, then it wouldn't be such a big deal. But the issue is there's, there's Indone the Indonesian resources is really unique. Um, there is some high-grade material that's um, in, uh, in New Caledonia, which is a little further away than Indonesia. However, um, the resource there is committed to two local plants um, and then to two existing joint ventures uh, with Japan and Korea. And the, and the mining company in the northern part of New Caledonia that's part of the joint venture has actually been struggling to supply its Korean partner with the ore grade that it needs. So New Caledonia is not going to be a source of ore uh, for China. The next nearest place is, is Philippines, which literally has about a tenth or less uh, of the reserve base that uh, Indonesia does, um, and it has uh, um, a much lower grade material on average than what's available in Indonesia. So we think at best um, the Philippines is going to be able to replace 10 to 20 percent of the ore that was shipped out of Indonesia last year. And again, you know that this the scarcity in ore supply um, has has already been reflected in the fact that you've seen this this you know almost three more than threefold increase in ore prices uh, in just the last four months. Mark, does the events with Russia, the sanctions with Russia, and and trade issues, potential trade issues with Russia, does that affect nickel at all? Um, it's definitely getting a lot of airplay, um, and fundamentally, I don't think it'll have any impact at all. If, if they can't ship it to the West, they'll end up going to China. Um, one thing, though, that it does really highlight, you know, again, when people maybe hear, okay, 25% of supplies come out of the market, and then, okay, why has a nickel gone up fourfold, and I'm, I, why aren't I hearing about it on CNBC every day? Well, one of the reasons is that the last time, you know, there was a lot of equity investment opportunities in nickel was really back in 2007. 
Uh, and at that time, Indonesia was less, was about 10% of world supply. And so people really have this, this, this 2007 mindset still in their head. And at that time, Canada and Russia were the most important nickel producers. So the fact that the Russian, Russian story is getting more airtime than the Indonesian story, I think reflects that people still have this 2007 fact set in their head. Today, Indonesia is as, is more than twice as big as Russia and is equal to Canada plus Russia and then some. So, you know, th- again, just sort of driving home just how much of world supply um, Indonesia represents, which has now come offline and no longer available to the market. Mark, you mentioned comparisons to 2007 when we had that last uh, run-up in in the nickel price. Uh, But at that time, there was uh, a project cupboard of uh, a large list of projects. uh, uh, But now in 2014, you see there's very few uh, quality nickel projects. Can you talk to us about uh, how Dumont, Royal Nickels Dumont project fits in that project cupboard? Sure. No, I mean, the reason I came to Royal Nickel back in 2010 was this sort of structural supply shortage, um, which began with uh, a big, you have to go back 40 years, back to the late 60s. Um, nickel prices got up to $8 a pound in 1968 terms. And it set off a massive exploration and development boom, which found that long list of projects that were sitting in the cupboard up until the middle part of this decade. Um, and the reason why they sat around is they were discovered just in time for the 1970s economic slowdown. And, you know, for metals, that carried right through until the 1980s. Uh, unfortunately for the nickel market, you know, a lot of other metals did well in the 1990s. But for nickel, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, which at that time both produced and consumed 20% of world supply. Well, when their economy collapsed, all of that nickel came out on the market. So, th- you know, these projects sat around for another um, 10 to 15 years until we got to that big price spike. So, so what happened was those projects all got financed and put into construction at that time. But up, you know, for that past 40 years, the nickel industry with that long list of projects, all they did was refresh the feasibility studies on those projects every cycle, hoping that maybe this time they're going to be they were going to be needed. Um, as a result, there was very little greenfield exploration and development. And so today, like you pointed out, there's really only about a year and a half's worth of supply sitting in the cupboard. And we need, you know, by, that could come online by 2020. And we obviously need, you know, four times that much to come online. Dumont's one of the few projects that can come online uh, well before 2020. It's positioned to take, you know, take advantage of what we think is going to be the best, best nickel market uh, so far. Mark, let's discuss that alliance uh that uh, with uh, Tsing Shan mm-hmm. um, and the construction um, of a, a stainless steel plant that will be able to utilize uh, nickel sulfide concentrate and what that means uh, for for Royal Nickel. Yeah, no, that's a that's a um, something that we're we're quite proud of. We're basically um, developing an entire newly uh, new new route to market um, for nickel concentrate. Uh, again, 70% of, of nickel gets used to make stainless steel. So as an industry, we need to think about what's the lowest cost way and the highest value way to get um, a ton of nickel out of the ground and, and into, into stainless steel. Um, when you have a, the kind of nickel concentrate that we have, um, the only element that's re- really in there that stainless steel mill can't handle directly is sulfur. So historically, the... Um, Nickel producers have had to ship sulfide concentrate to a smelter and refinery, and the smelter and refinery have basically taken 20 to 30 percent of the of the nickel price, um, you know, you know, for turning that into a, a pure nickel product. Um, what what we're pioneering with with Qingshan, um, they're constructing a plant uh, today using other people's feed because our feed isn't going to be ready for a few years yet. Um, but what will happen is sulfide concentrate will show up. Um, they use a very simple roasting step process that dries off the sulfur. And once the sulfur is gone, then it creates a, um, a feed um, that can go directly into the stainless steel process and comes out um, as stainless steel. What that does is open the market for us from, from this half a dozen smelter refiners today um, to any, you know, basically the 30 or 40 stainless steel mills, nickel pig iron plants, or fair nickel producers who can all use our feed directly once the um, once the sulfur's out of the way. Um, it also, um, it's a much, much simpler and lower cost process than traditional smelting and refining, so it creates the you know, potential for 
the nickel producer to get you know another five or ten percentage points or even more um, of the end value of the product flowing back to the producer as opposed to the the, the smelter refiner. So we think it's a real game changer, and over the next few years, um, you'll see more and more companies copy Qingshan. They're the market leader in China. Um, They're the market leader in stainless globally. Um, And as a direct result of that, um, we were contacted just a few weeks ago by a European stainless producer who saw that news and said, you know, can we talk to you about doing something similar with you um, with our facilities in Europe? Mark, we've talked about some of the fundamentals with nickel. We talked about the highlights of the Dumont project. Uh, You already have a feasibility study on the project. Could you comment and sort of highlight for uh, subscribers who be, may be new to the Royal Nickel story, the, the billion dollar uh, opportunity and the economics from the feasibility study that describes this Dumont Nickel project? Sure. Um, w- you know, what we're building will be one of the five largest nickel sulfide operations uh, in the world. That will be one of the largest base metal mines in Canada. We're basically taking the same um, mid-scale open pit uh, you know, open pit operations you'd see in copper and gold and just applying it to a low-grade uh, nickel deposit. Uh, we're doing it in a, in a great uh, jurisdiction and in a region in that jurisdiction, um, the Abitibi region of Quebec, uh, where we have all the infrastructure in place and the Quebec government provides uh, competitive power costs of 4.5 cents a kilowatt hour, which are, you know, much much lower cost um, than a lot of jurisdictions. Um, Right now, we uh, we are in the public hearing phase of our, our permitting process. Uh, we will have permits uh, by the end of the year. Quebec has a very uh, transparent and straightforward uh, permitting process. They permitted half a dozen mines in the last five years, um, and we're not expecting any surprises from here um, to the end of the year. Um, and with financing in place um, by the first quarter of 2015, we'll be able to begin construction um, and be uh, have first door through the mill in 2016 and ramp up to 2017. So, you know, we're getting very close to, uh, to uh, um, taking the project forward to the next phase. Well, Mark Selby, CEO of Royal Nickel, which can be traded as RNX on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Thanks so much for being back here with us and for giving us an update on Royal Nickel. Thanks, Jeb. I always look forward to uh, our discussions and look forward to talking again soon. 